What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to another episode of Triple Thrift Podcast. Um, this is episode three, season one. I just want to thank all of the ears that are listening on in to the three of us. I'm here with my two best friends, Drew Profit Monsters and Josh, the hairiest of all tornadoes, aka Harry Tornado. And in today's video, um, we're just going to talk about, you know, basically what we have been going on um, in the, you know, in the past week of, you know, what's been going on on eBay, um, YouTube, and you name it. Um, it's going to be a really good podcast here. And um, let's get it started. So, Josh, what's going on with you? What's up, Joey? Happy to be here, man. It was, uh, it was, a, good, it was a good week for me. I was laughing a little bit because you said in today's video, it's so hard to turn it off. Like, because we say that all the time. I make like three videos a week. You guys are putting out a ton of videos. Uh, and it's hard to like switch from video to podcast. But uh, but yeah, uh, this week was good, man. We uh, had, I guess, sales have been a little bit slower for me just because I've been I always try to hit YouTube really hard, like coming into the end of the month, trying to end on a, on a good note. Um, and uh, that's that's basically what I've been doing the last couple of weeks. So I haven't been listing a ton. Um, I don't I think I probably listed like 10 items this this whole past week. So you list 10 what items in a whole week on with that, Josh. I, I'm just <laughs> I mean, you should know better than to be on a podcast with me and tell me <laughs> you listed ten items this week. I know, I know, man. It's uh, I'm not, I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud of it. But it's not like I'm not working. You know, I'm just switching my focus from eBay to YouTube at the yeah, end of the month. It's a different type of work. Yeah, but uh, but I know, like, if like I said, if you if you list ten items a week, you're gonna have crap sales. I think I had three things going out tomorrow. Uh, so definitely gonna hit listing hard this week going into November, going into you know the meat of Q4. I'm super excited about that. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was just a, just a good week, man. Happy Halloween. <laughs> yeah. Happy, happy Halloween to you guys too. <laughs> you want to know, you wanna, why I said it like that is because you want to know what I did for Halloween? What? I was listing at my house. <laughs> um, so spooky. But- <laughs> I between this week has been a really good week for me, actually. Like my sales are, are way up. Um, And I'm just really, I've just been really hitting it hard. Um, I'm just been listing like a maniac. I just put out a video called I'm a reselling maniac. And uh, I just been listing like crazy in my office and in the living room, you know, taking pictures. Um, I've got some really big announcements coming soon, but they're not finalized yet. So I can't say anything, Uh, but business is growing and, and things are just looking really good right now. Um, put out a couple videos this week that I was, I'm really excited about. I have a new video coming out next week that I'm super excited about. It's completely different from anything that you've seen on my channel. And um, yeah, sales are really good. I think I have like somewhere around 20 sales going out um, this weekend. And my average sale price is like, (laughs) no joke, my average sale price is like $90 an item right now. That's nuts. I've got like three Nintendo Wii consoles going out. One was a rock band set that sold on Facebook Marketplace for 180. A couple jackets that I sold for 99. A Magnolite pan for 99. Um, I just had some a jacket I sold on Depop for 99 dollars. Um, a couple Mercari sales. A Nintendo 64. Yeah. So I mean, I'm just really excited, man. It's a, it's been a good week for me. That's awesome, Joey. How was uh, how was your week? Uh, my week was pretty good. Um... I I'm just kind of same with Josh right now, and I, I didn't really list as much as I should have. And I drew I know Drew's gonna yell at me, but you, <laughs> you know, guys you dude, we can't odd man out here. You know we can't it, compare ourselves to Drew. Drew is just <laughs> he's a reselling maniac, man. <laughs> we can't keep up with him. Uh, but you know it it went pretty good. It's just the only thing, like I said from last week. You know uh, I'm so glad the election is uh, Tuesday because. I'm so done with this political mail. I've been staying at work at like seven o'clock every single night. And it's just so annoying. I go in at seven and literally get off at seven. It's just a really long day. Um, so I know I'm going to be picking back up with eBay and stuff. Um, like every Monday night, I do my live listings and, um, which was really cool. We just got in a brand new desk from Amazon and, um, I go to open it just not too long ago. I opened the whole thing and you know what was missing guys? <laughs> what? like the nuts and bolts like <laughs> like i'm like are you kidding me i just bought a 120 dollar desk off amazon and i don't have the nuts and bolts to put this thing together like this is crazy so i called amazon and um they're gonna send out a brand new one 
And um, I can't wait for that to come in because if you guys could see what kind of desk I'm working with, it's like, it's not even a desk. It's like an L shaped, like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like a singular desk. That's only like, yay high, <laughs> like chest <laughs> high. <laughs> for those of you listening on the podcast, high that is. Yay high. <laughs> um, yeah, but, don't worry. <laughs> but I, I, you know, it's just, it's been tough for me just listening on that little thing and doing my listening live. So wanted to grow up a little bit and get a man shaped desk an L shaped desk. So um, now I got to wait till Wednesday for it to come in and I have to put it together. So, but well, other than the listings done on your live tomorrow, that's all I got to say. <laughs> I'll make it work. I'll make it work. Um, but other than that, I had a, I had a pretty cool sale. Um, I had an Oogie Boogie um, souvenir popcorn bucket. Um, it was green. I think it was from two years ago, 2018. Um, it was a really cool, you know, popcorn thing. And I sold it for $29.99 and I bought it for, I think it was like two bucks at a Goodwill. So that was awesome. Nice. I got a uh, Pluto Christmas popcorn bucket oh, yeah. yesterday for $2.99. Yeah, I saw that. That was cool hmm. on your uh, Instagram story. Oh yeah. Yesterday I just had a, I had a killer day yesterday between, between, and I didn't even find that much stuff. Um, which is like kind of abnormal for me because I'm normally like buying a lot on the weekends and then I tend to not thrift as much because I just, I'm more of like a bulk buyer. I don't know. I'm not like a a one-off item type of guy. Like I don't care to go to Goodwill and buy one or two things and then go to another Goodwill, buy one or two things. I'd rather just like get it all done. You know, I've almost changed up my sourcing strategy a little bit now that my time is so much more valuable based on how much effort I'm putting into this business and the, and podcast and YouTube and everything that I'm honestly just enjoying the strategy that I'm working with right now for Q4, where I'm bulking up on the weekends and then I'm kind of, you know, surviving through the week by listing all that kind of stuff. And, you know, then if I run out of inventory, I'll check thrift stores or whatever, but like, I'm not desperate for inventory right now. Um, but I'm constantly listing. So, so that's a, that's a really good question to, to pop off right here. Um, so what is, let's, let's go with Josh first. Um, Josh, what do you, what is your favorite day or kind of like the, the best day that either Goodwill, Salvation Army, or however you thrift, um, what's the best day to go, um, thrifting? Uh, honestly, I don't, I've never figured out like a, a true schedule. Like it really, especially with the Goodwills, Goodwills are totally unpredictable. Salvation Army is pretty good. They, they're on this weird, like covid schedule where they don't open until 12 every day um so like i've said in my videos in the past like i love getting the salvation army right when they open it's because they get there at like 10 and start putting out new stuff and so when they open at 12 it's just like a free-for-all you just go in there and find everything some people are like well goodwill opens and they don't they don't they open and then they start putting out stuff i'm like yeah well this is not this is not goodwill uh, so it's, it really just depends on, on the store, but Salvation Army, I like to go on Mondays. I usually take my packages to that post office. That's, uh, kind of farther away, but mm-hmm. is more reliable. So I could, I don't have to wait in line. I just drop them off. I trust them to scan them in. And then I head to that, uh, Salvation Army when they open at 12, um, usually find some pretty good stuff. Goodwill is just, it really depends on who's working, man. Sometimes you go like 11, 12 o'clock and they still haven't put out anything new since yesterday. And then sometimes you get there right when they open and they're putting out two or three buggies worth of stuff. And uh, so I, I don't, I don't know. I don't really have a schedule uh, for Goodwill, but Mondays are typically pretty good for me. Um, Saturdays suck. Like I was talking to Haley this past weekend. She was like, um, do you want to go to, do you want to go to Goodwill today? We're talking Saturday. I'm like, honestly, not really. Cause I don't remember the last time I found something good at a Goodwill or any thrift store on a Saturday. It's always so crowded, so picked over. Um, I don't know. I just find much better deals Saturdays at, at garage sales or dream deals or, um, you know, places like that. Goodwill Saturdays at Goodwills are not the place to be in my opinion. Yeah. I'm starting to find too, like for me, like what I was saying with bulk buying and stuff is just the garage sales and the flea markets are starting to p- pick up a little bit here in Florida, which for the whole summer garage sales were like dead. And so I was putting a lot more time into, um, Goodwills when they opened after the quarantine and stuff like that. But now, I'm telling you, man, the flea market is like changing the game for me. And there, I have two flea markets, one that's like 20 minutes away from me. And then one that's like 25 minutes away. And they're in the opposite direction of each other. One's like East Orlando and one's West Orlando, I guess you could say just for, you know, directional purposes. But so I can't really hit both on the same day, but no matter which one I go to, I usually do pretty well. 
And um, those are just keeping me like on fire right now where I can go to one location and just really do good. And then kind of, you know, hit garage sales on the way there or on the way back, you know, just looking for signs and stuff because yard sale treasure map in my area is just completely irrelevant. It doesn't work. But what I think one thing that Joey and I might have going for us is being in Florida right now with the weather just doesn't really get cold. I think we're going to have garage sales all the way up until December. So we have like a little bit of an advantage to people like, let's just say Troy mountain man treasure who, you know, on YouTube who, uh, you know, it's basically snowing in Montana every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think, you know, down, especially you guys down in Florida, uh, I'm in South Carolina and I think we all, we have similar weather starting to cool down a little bit, but we don't have, I think you guys probably have more rain than we do in South Carolina, but uh, you know, if you live rains every day, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, but usually it doesn't last very long. You know, it's, it's over within a couple hours. Yeah. Uh, But we, I think that's a huge advantage being in Southeast, you know, good weather, more yard sales year round, cheaper prices typically in my, my experience. Yeah. It's it's Uh, very, it's, it's very, the prices are very different by you. Cause you say, Oh, I get shoes for five 99. I'm like, I wish I can get shoes for five 99. I mean, they're at, yeah. you know, mine's nine 99. Drew's is like 50 99. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's yeah, just yesterday, yesterday I was in a thrift store. And, um, if you saw my Instagram with the Pluto popcorn bucket, I had picked up three pairs of shoes. I picked up a pair of Nike SB dunks that were youth size, but they're still selling for like between a hundred to $150. I paid five ninety nine for those, and then I got a pair of KD basketball shoes, and those were fourteen ninety nine. And then I found a pair of Air Monarchs, Nike Air Monarchs, which I bought for myself because they're like the dad shoe or whatever. <laughs> and I just thought it would always be funny to have a pair of those. And they, but they were seventeen ninety nine, which is still way more than I would ever pay to resell a pair of shoes at Goodwill. But I was like, you know what? I'm gonna buy them for myself, and then I'll just sell them and get my money back when I'm done using them. Uh, but yeah, the prices are all over the place at my Goodwills and, and they're all so inconsistent. One day it could be six ninety nine, one day it's nine ninety nine, one day it's forty nine mm-hmm. ninety nine. And you know, they don't know any of the values. They just make up their own prices based on if they yeah. think it looks cool. Because the dunks could sell for $150 and they were priced at six bucks, and the KDs are gonna sell for probably like sixty or seventy and they had them priced at fifteen. So they clearly don't know what they're doing for some stuff. And the and the monarchs are worth 15 <laughs> they had them priced at yeah. 17. yeah literally <laughs> like a 29.99 shoe <laughs> it, it, yeah it's, just, it's the same thing here man like we uh we, you know with, with shoes there's one goodwill in my area that that prices shoes outside of the norm like the uh, if, if you guys listen to the podcast don't know most goodwills are run regionally so in my area they're all kind of under the same upper level management so they have a system where all adult shoes are six dollars and fifty cents kids shoes are four dollars and fifty cents Adult boots are eight dollars and fifty cents, and most Goodwills in the area adhere to that policy. Occasionally, if they, you know, somebody donates a pair of brand new Harley Davidson boots, you know, they throw those in the in the glass case for you know thirty forty bucks, which is still a pretty good deal. Uh, but there's one Goodwill; it's the newest one they built, and they just have like a shoe boutique section where they only put out one of the pairs, and then you have to take it up there and yep, and, they do that in my store too. But but it, the stuff they put is like. They'll have a pair of like men's Sperry's that are like, you know, used, like they have a little curl, like the little elf shoe, you know, and they'll have that for 1997, <laughs> but then they'll have a pair of, you know, Nike air force ones for 650. I'm like, I, I don't understand. Like if you have a shoe boutique session section, you should do your research and put good shoes there. Not like, I mean, I guess eventually they'll sit there long enough that they'll realize that what they did was dumb. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I'm not complaining, you know, because it's, it's fun going. It's I enjoy going to see what their boutique check section is compiled of and then go into the regular section and finding the most valuable shoe in the store. Right. Uh, but I, I don't know if you're going to if you're going to price price your shoes up, you need to hire somebody that actually knows what they're doing, not just guessing. Yeah, that's like that's like the Plato's closet in my area is there's there's like four Plato's closets within probably an hour drive of me in any given direction. And the one closest to my house that Joey and I went, I guess you could say thrifting at where we got each got a pair of shoes. They normally are like the best priced for shoes. And then the other Plato's closets, you could go in and like a pair of Jordans, they have like $95 or Air Max 95s, they want $89 for them or something. And I'm like, bro, you can go get these brand new at Ross for $49.99. And Plato's is selling them used for 
you know, 89. Now, granted, they still sell for more than that on eBay because it's a popular model or make or whatever, but still, it's just crazy, like, how different stores... One of the Play-Dohs I went to, I was asking them about a pair of shoes, and they said they have a, a shoe guy, you know, that all he does is come in and price the shoes for them and tell them what's a hype shoe and what's not. And then yeah. the one by my house is, like, a bunch of 16-year-old high school girls that, you know, are looking for Lululemon and, and crop tops you yeah, know, they just so, see the Nike check and all Nikes are created equal, whether they're <laughs> free runs from 2013 or Jordan ones, you know, they're all Nike. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So, um, but so let's, let's move on from talking about, you know, the thrifting here or the aspect of like the prices to a little bit of something that I wanted to talk about. If you guys are okay with it, um, no, eBay. I'm not, I'm not okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you wouldn't be Joey, but that's because you haven't done enough listings to know what I'm going to say. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Jeez. I guess that applies to me I've, too. <laughs> I've probably done over a hundred listings this week easily, probably closer to 150. That's awesome. Dude, I need, I need to do my Instagram motivation again, where I would, I'd post like a screenshot of my current eBay listings. I'm like, all right guys, if I don't hit, you know, I'm at 400 active listings. If I don't post a screenshot by 5 p.m. today showing 450 active, I'm going to give away 100 bucks. Yeah. And I've, I've done idea. that two or three times and it works because I'm like, oh, man, dang, now I got to list 50 things today. I'm not going to give away 100 bucks. Yeah. But I just don't, I don't do it because I know it's going to work. I'm like, I don't want to list 50 yeah, things. So exactly. I'm not going to do that. I just need to do it. So, but as far as eBay is concerned, let's let's move on to this topic because I think it's one that a lot of people can relate to. You know, you guys both sell on eBay primarily, and I am a cross lister. So like I have my opinions about every platform, but I think it's easily agreed amongst most resellers that eBay is by far the best and most frustrating platform to sell on at the same time. Meaning that eBay has, for example, like the highest reach, the, the most worldwide reach for anything you could imagine to sell or buy compared to any other platform. Now, eBay is also the most frustrating because they're, you know, still in the stone ages of how they run their website. So um, I think that, you know, let's let's talk about that for a second. And, you know, I guess we'll start with Joey. You can let me know, like, since you're, I guess you could say the newest to reselling on eBay between the three of us. What's your your favorite thing about eBay? And then what's the most frustrating thing that you've experienced with eBay? Um, so... My favorite thing about eBay is that I can, that's my like encyclopedia. You know, I tell everybody all the time, if you ever need to find something, you know, go straight to eBay, you know, find the sold comps, um, find what's listed. Um, what's, what's bad about eBay or, or something like that. Um, there's a lot of things, you know, um, like I, I <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> you know, um, probably you know, the return policy. Yeah, we would, everybody would say the return policy. It's just so, it's so difficult. I mean, I just had a return for, um, for destiny. Um, she had a, um, the VCR, you know, double combo with the DVD action inside of it. Um, it, they, it got to, it was a drop shipper. So, you know, I, I packaged this thing up so amazing, you know, for destiny, cause she doesn't really know how to do it. So I put it in bubble wrap, doubled it up, um, made it really nice. And I sent it out and what happened was it was past its 30 days. And, you know, I told destiny, I was like, don't do anything. Like don't click a button. Don't do anything because <laughs> it's past 30 days. That's their own problem. We have a policy where if it's past 30 days, you know, it's not refundable, you know, but sure enough, my girl <laughs> clicks the button and, you know, and it returns and, and, and it was like a hundred, like a whole total of a hundred dollars, you know, for the shipping labels, like 30, you know, 60 for the whole combo. It was just, I felt so bad for her and she had to, you know, spend a hundred bucks. I was like, next time you'll listen to me. But, um, <laughs> you know, and we tried contacting eBay and like, I was texting you guys in the middle of the week and I was like, is there any way I can get a number or something? And, you know, I couldn't contact anybody and it's like really tough. I mean, I just contacted Amazon about this desk and I talked to them in two seconds. I feel like, yeah. I feel like eBay needs to really pick it up you know it's but it's the best platform to sell on you know it's just like it's like a give and take you know what do you guys think yeah i think it's definitely like a mix mash of 
you know, it's a love hate relationship for me, for sure. I, I'm out of all the platforms I sell on, I make the most money on eBay, but out of all the platforms I sell on, I have the most headaches with eBay as well. And it's not just because I sell more stuff. It's just their platform in general is more frustrating to me than the other platforms, you know, like let's use a couple examples here, you know, and Josh, if you want to cut in and say anything, you know, feel free to jump in with what I'm saying here. But, um, you know, you have, for example, like clothing items, when you're selling a clothing item on Poshmark or Depop or Mercari, you know, you can go in there, you can upload the pictures, you say the brand, the size, you know, and you put in your item description and your price on eBay, you have to put in like 47 item specifics about the cotton blend, the, you know, (laughs) all all these different things. It just wants to ask all these ridiculous questions. And really all people want to know is the size, the color, and the brand, you know, and then you put the details in, in your item description. So I don't understand why eBay, and now they had this big mess up a couple of weeks ago, which people are still trying to fix, including myself, about the item specifics, where if your item specifics aren't uh, um, updated the way eBay wants them, your items are like essentially being hidden from people's searches because you're not putting in enough item specifics or whatever. Like eBay hasn't come out and said that that's what's happening, but everybody's noticing it. Um, yeah. Their items are getting less views. You know, you can put up a vintage t-shirt and normally you could average, let's say 10 to 20 views within the first 30 minutes of posting it. And you may get one or two views and you're like, okay, something's wrong here. Um, you know, so like, you didn't put in the theme of the t-shirt. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, features. Like, what do you mean features? There's no features. It's a t-shirt. You it know, has a tag and sleeves. <laughs> Those are all the features that it has. I don't, I don't get it. I don't, what I don't understand is why it's required. Like I should be able to list whatever I want. Like if I want to list a t-shirt with one picture and just list the title as t-shirt, yeah, just let me do it. It's never going to sell, but I just need to figure that out. Don't make me put in all this information. Exactly. And, and I get it that it's not, not. I, I've said it in one of my videos and people are like, well, it doesn't require that much. I'm like, it does if you have a lot of listings. Like if you have to go back, if, if you know, uh, I think about like tech and sports, the guy that lists like only clothing, he's got like 18, 19,000 listings. And it was so frustrating for him when when this thing happened last year, right at the start of freaking Q4, eBay starts pulling this crap. And he had like 12,000 listings that he had to go manually edit. And he was posting about it. He was like, you know, when they told me I had to manually edit, I was like, no, it's easier for me to take all 19,000 of my listings over to Mercari if I have to go and manually fix 12,000 listings. And then after he said that, he got somebody on the phone and, you know, they were able to give him like a some Excel spreadsheet for him to go and he still kind of had to manually do it. But that's, that's one thing. Like I get it that you need to make updates, but why at the start of Q4, the very beginning of the bit, do this crap in January or February or in the summer, you know, I I don't understand that. You would think too, that like when companies are running businesses as big as eBay is, I mean, this is a conglomerate, you know, a worldwide conglomerate of, you know, people that like us that actually run businesses through their their program, their website, their app, you would think that they would send some type of update or message or email or notification saying, hey, we are in the process of doing this. Please make sure that your listings are updated by X date versus just waking up and your listings are gone or, you know, you're not getting sales because of this. It's the same thing as like the Vero program is, you know, sometimes eBay will warn you and sometimes they won't. Sometimes you'll get banned for three days. Sometimes they'll just completely block your account and say, nope, you can't sell on eBay anymore. And it's almost like there's just no filter for how they actually run their processes because maybe there's too many people on eBay that their staff can't handle it. I honestly don't know, you know, but they definitely need to do a better job. And I think most people agree with that, that, you know, it's extremely frustrating for full-time sellers like myself who are relying on eBay to um, pay my bills and support my family. I would say for me, the most frustrating thing that I experience is sold awaiting payment. It makes no sense to me that a buyer can go in and click that they want to buy it and then not pay for it until they decide they want to pay for it. Like I sold a shirt last night. I had it listed for $199. It's a rare polo Ralph Lauren sailing nautical button down shirt. I got it retail arbitrage. I paid $29 for it. Listed it for 200 because I was like one of the only listings at the time. And 
Today, I finally, or yesterday, I finally accepted an offer of $125 free shipping on it, which is a great sale in my opinion. The guy messages me today and says, hi, is this item brand new? I will pay in a few days. Thanks. First of all, the listing clearly says in the title and description that it's new. So why are you asking that after you already clicked purchase? And then yeah. why can you not pay for it for a couple days? It just makes no sense to me. On Poshmark, Mercari, and Depop, you have to, when you click buy item, you are obligated to that purchase unless you put in a cancellation request and Poshmark or Mercari approves that cancellation. Yeah. So it doesn't make any sense to me and it's just so frustrating. I probably got... It, it seems like it would be easier for everybody involved, including eBay, if it were like you just had your credit card information on file and you just had to click buy once. Because, And I don't, it's not every listing. Sometimes... I guess I guess when you listen on him, you can do like a require immediate pay, which I probably should. But especially with I, I've had more issues with auctions, like people that bid on stuff and then they win and then they don't pay. And they're like, oh, it's, uh, you know, I was just bidding. And I'm like, no, like if you if you place a bid on an item on eBay, eBay should like put a hold on your card for that amount. One hundred percent. There's there's absolutely no excuse for somebody to be able to go and do fake bids. And you're seeing that, you know, which is really frustrating and people find it so funny is and I'm getting frustrated kind of talking about it. So forgive my tone here, gentlemen, but TikTok this full full you know, full uh, just a quick I I super appreciate eBay. eBay if you're listening to this podcast, I, I highly about, doubt it. I was just about to say I say eBay, yeah, like, we, I love we, you. We love you. <laughs> you're really I, annoying. I but do love you. You make a lot of money. I make, I make most money on eBay, like I said, so I'm very thankful for eBay, but some of their procedures, like we're in, we're in the year 2020 <laughs> right now. Like it should not be this complicated to make somebody, you know, plug in their credit card information before they just click buy. But yeah. you have people like on TikTok who are making these painting pictures and yeah. then posting it up on eBay. And then people on TikTok are seeing the eBay link, you know, and it, the video goes viral and then people are bidding on it. And next thing you know, that painting is at a bid of $106,000 and it's a 14 year old kid from TikTok who's bidding on it, who's never going to pay for it. And then it tanks the painting, you know, art market, actual artists who do it for a living are going to struggle and, and get messed up from it because these TikTok videos, you know, are promoting that it's okay to do things like that when people are actually using eBay to run their business. Yeah. Right. So I just, I, I can't even, I, you know, it, I, I, like I said, I am frustrated, but at the same time, like I am thankful. I have a love hate relationship with eBay because I can sell a hat, you know, that like I sold a hat over the weekend that's going across the country to like, I don't know, I have to look, it's like Denmark or something like that, you know? And so like, I would never have that exposure with Poshmark because Poshmark is only in the United States. You know, yeah. it wasn't like a big sale, but it was a 20 or a $40 hat a vintage hat, and then the buyer paid international shipping of $21. So a $61 sale for a hat, you know, but the fact that like I'm making sales to people all across the world is just really cool to be part of that, like with eBay. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's the same thing with the postal service. Like we can sit here and complain about the, especially lately, you know, guys Wait, like talking, Joey. Are over, you talking about me or? <laughs> I'm talking, no, no. But I mean, it's no, it's no secret that the postal service has been struggling significantly over the last four to five months, four to six months, I guess. But it's still necessary. I'm not going to ship all my items with UPS and or FedEx. It's just not realistic. Right. So it's like, yeah, we have a lot like I appreciate you, you mail carriers. It's a sucky job. I'd never do it. I, my friend Heather is a mail carrier for like a rural. It's a tough word to say rural route. Rural. She has to use her own own car. And I guess she makes a lot of money. They pay her like, I don't know, whatever an hourly rate is plus mileage. She's probably working like 30 hours overtime. She works so much, but she just complains on Facebook all the time about how terrible the job is and how many hours she's working and yeah. how her car breaks down all the time. I'm like, that just sounds terrible. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, I really appreciate you. Like I could second that because, you know, even even right now, it's just so tough with this political mail. I mean, you have like, I don't know if you guys get it in the mail, but I'm sure you do all the time. Man. It's, it, it's just insane of the amounts of just mail that people are just going to throw away. But you know, that's how yeah. we get paid, you know, which I'm very thankful for. Um, but I can definitely feel uh, Heather's pain on that. Yeah, we th the other day, I felt so bad. My I was uh, I met my mail lady at the at the road to give her my packages. 
uh, th- when I see her, I trust her. She knows I need my stuff scanned. So I gave it to her and she gave me my mail and I looked at it. She was scanning my packages and I was looking through the mail and it was trash day. So my trash can was right there. I was like, I'm really sorry, but I'm gonna throw all this right in the, <laughs> right in the trash can. <laughs> like it's just, you know, a ton of political mail and, and coupon books and advertisements and credit card offers. And I don't understand why these companies still think that it's profitable to send stuff like that in the mail. Like I'm sure, I guess people fall for it, which is why it's so profitable, but I've never, I've never even opened it. And now they're getting slick. They're sending stuff without like, uh, I'll, I'll get mail that looks really official. That has like the little perforated edges on it. And it just says like my address and name. <laughs> there's no, like, no sender on it. <laughs> there's nothing there, It's just empty. I'm like, what is this? Is this like the IRS? Like what, what? And I open it and it's like, get $500 in your account by today. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. they tricked me. <laughs> you rip it up. <laughs> yeah. Throw it right in the trash. Junk mail, man. But it's keeping, it's keeping mail carriers busy. It's keeping the paper companies uh dunder mifflin it's keeping the paper companies busy giving them business so i guess it's a necessary evil but, but i'd uh, rather be reselling full-time no i'm just kidding <laughs> Not really. joey really does joey really wants to be a full-time reseller yeah. but he just the mail carriers it's a, it's a tough job to to get into man you like yeah people that do that their whole life you. and retire what'd you say they said yeah because they won't hire you <laughs> <laughs> They wouldn't hire Drew. He's still salty about it. Still salty, but I bet they'd uh, hire you now, man. They're desperate. I know. I see. I got it. I got um an advertisement, like a letter saying that the postal service is hiring. And I'm like, yep, no, thanks. You had your chance to have me. <laughs> now I'm very happy. What, what is something interesting? What is the worst job you guys have ever had? Oh, my gosh. I think me and Drew can um, collaborate on this one with the with Publix. Um, if 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 you want to agree, Drew, but with me with Publix, man, I felt like I was used and abused there. You know, I, me and Drew, I mean, we're, I mean, I sp- you are too, Josh. I'm sure. I, we For those very- who don't know, Publix is a grocery store in Florida. Oh yeah, a super like a super. We have them in South Carolina too. Oh, you do? Oh, okay, cool. They're, yeah, they're, they're slowly moving upward, but they're in the oh. south southeast mainly. Um, I've always compared them to like the Chick Fil A of grocery stores because they're super polite, really good quality, but. It's a grocery store. They're gonna treat their employees like a, a you know, a, a bag of potatoes. Just yeah, a bag of potatoes. Just it's, stand there. It's and, like when you go to a restaurant and you order food and it's like really nice and the service out front is good, but then you get a job there. All the cooks smoke cigarettes, don't wash their hands, drop yeah. chicken wings on the floor before they drop them in the deep fryer. You know, <laughs> it's it's bad. It's a five star restaurant right there. <laughs> five and so half. so. What was bad about working in Publix? And nothing against Publix. They have really good, uh, you know, as a customer, Shopping I've had nothing is but positive. Really a pleasure at Publix, but working there is not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, just think about, you know, you know, you bust your, you know, your butt all day, you know, <laughs> and it, it's just, you know, I got taken advantage of, you know, and I wanted to move up, you know, I was the, I was the person to, you know, just like Drew says, like, I'm just like the yes man. Like, I'll just be like, yes, like I'll do it, you know, and I make it look so good. And then like, you know, the next day, you know, you come in and you feel like, you know, you're on top of the world and they're like, you know, you got to do this, this and this. And you see the other workers just standing around like, why can't mm-hmm. we do it together? You know what I mean? Like, I know I work hard, but, you know, I did the whole frozen section in uh, at Publix and, you know, I had that thing looking pristine. When I talk pristine, like you can lick the ice inside. Like, it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not even kidding. Like, and, you know, they just took really big advantage of me. And I tried to move up and I, I started wearing like the collared shirts, like um, like the dress up shirts with ties. And, you know, I, I tried to, you know, fit the part and I wanted to move up. And I told him, like, look, you know, push me, you know, and it took me six months to get full time at Publix. And they said that's the fastest time anyone has ever got full time at Publix. And they said it's in the history books. And I was like, there's no way like, you know, but you know, I did get it really fast. Like there's people in there waiting three to four, maybe even five years just to get full time with the benefits and everything. And, you know, wow. I, I just worked so hard to get there. And I was like, I just want to move up like, you know, and then I don't know if it was like a policy where you have to work in a certain place at one time. Um, but, you know, I was doing, you know, I was doing good. Like I felt like I could just push up, you know, and just keep going. But they just didn't 
But didn't. they just kept pushing you down. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And then they pushed me away and I got the job at the post office, baby. Let's go. And then now Let's I want to go. Be, and now I just want to be a full time reseller. But, you know, I've moved up. You know, I learned I'm only 23. So, you know, yeah, you got plenty. Of, you got plenty of time. Yeah. Unlike uh, us old folk over here in the 30s. Mm-hmm. But I, I would I would have to probably agree with Joey as far as like as a whole Publix was my least favorite job because I was just like Joey, like. I, I believe, you know, um, for those who don't know, I'm a Christian. And so I believe in like biblical principles. And one of the things the Bible says is in everything you do, do as unto the Lord, not as unto man. And I'm not trying to get religious on anybody, you know, but that is just like my, was my mantra. No matter what job I had, I would always do it as, as, as if I was working for God and not for anybody else. So I would always give my best. I would always do it in excellence. I would, Mm -hmm. you know, if I was cleaning toilets, I would make sure those things were squeaky clean. You know, if I was mopping the floor, I'd make sure that I didn't miss spots. If I was sweeping Publix at night, you know, I'd make sure that like I didn't leave dust on the floor, whereas other people, you know, would walk past it. You know, if I see trash on the ground when I'm working my job, I stop and pick it up. And we get it, Drew. You're a great employee. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Wow. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You just get. I was like, is he gonna? Is he gonna keep going? <laughs> all, right. all right, all right, I'm done. But my point is that after after all of that, and I was part time, and they were giving me like somewhat full time hours, and I started to work with the full timers as a part time guy. You know, going in at four in the morning. You know, doing the same jobs that they were doing, and the full timers would always leave their their racks, is what they were called. You know, with the, the aisles that they worked on. And they wouldn't do a good job on it. And then I would have to work a night shift the next day and like make up for their lack of work, you know. And um, then, you know, I think I said this in our first podcast, but after a year of working for them, it came time for my, you know, evaluation. And I got like a 98 out of 100 and they gave me a nickel raise. And if that that is what I'm most salty about, like Publix actually wasn't really that bad. There are some bad people that work there and that's just any job. But um, mm. the fact that you work hard and, you know, you basically do everything they ask to get a 98 out of a hundred. And I think I only got a 98 because I was late like two times or something like that. So like my tardy score went down a little bit or something. Um, you know, you do all that work and then you don't get rewarded for it. You're just like, that was kind of the switch for me that when I was that age, when I was working for Publix, I said, I never want to work for anybody else ever again, if this is the way I'm going to get treated. And yeah. that was just kind of what flipped the switch for me is always figuring out a way to work for myself ever since that moment. And I've had other jobs since then, but it was always just racked in my brain. Like I need to figure out a way to work for myself because I don't want to be treated like that. I deserve better. And any, everyone deserves better. Nobody deserves that. For sure, man. It, like Kevin O'Leary, uh, he has, there's a YouTube video where he's the guy from Shark Tank. Yep. Uh, and he talked about like his first job was at like an ice cream shop and, uh, he was he was like trying to talk it was like in a mall and he was trying to talk to this girl and he had plans of getting off work and going to hang out with her and he went to uh went to go clock out and the store manager had asked him to like scrape the gum off the floor because people would just like throw their gum on the floor for some reason and he was like no i'm not doing that you hired me to be like a, it was like his first week there he's like you hired me to be a, a ice cream scooper i'm not gonna scrape gum and she's like you're an employee you're gonna do whatever i tell you to do and he was like, that night I quit and I said, I'm never going to work for anybody else ever again. I'm never going to let somebody else have that much control over me. Because if you're an employee, your employer does control you. Like you have to do whatever they say you know, if you want to keep your job. And working for yourself, man, it, it's the, the freedom I'm able to do. Like I, I can take my dog to the vet whenever I want. I can I can work whenever I want. I can not work whenever I want. I'm, I'm coming to see you guys in a couple of weeks for going to go to universal studios and hang out with you i don't have to ask off i don't have to write it on the sheet you know everybody's work at jobs you have to like ask off for time and then they don't get it to you and then you gotta joey did you get off work for that (laughs) (laughs) uh not yet but i I... (laughs) Uh, gotta write it on the sheet (laughs) man looks like it's just me and josh no i'll be there i don't care what i I hope nobody's they'll quit (laughs) (laughs) that might be the day i quit (laughs) that might be the day i quit I had to throw that in there since since Joey has to ask off work to hang out. We're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna bully Joey into quitting his job one day. It's like you're not you're not a real reseller unless you're full time, Joey. <laughs> I'm kidding. Please don't quit. Please don't quit your job. I always like it's flattering when people say that they watch my YouTube videos and they get motivated. Like, oh, I just I just want to quit my job and do what you're doing. I'm like, slow down. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's think about this. Like, 
you know, it, it takes a lot more into that. But, uh, but anyway, my, my worst job, I would, uh, honestly, I think it's Hardee's. I've had some really crappy jobs. Like KFC was a really bad job, but I worked there for two years. You know, they worked me like a dog working 50 hours a week. They, you know, they gave me a title of like assistant store manager. And I, this was when I was like 18, 19 years old. So when you're that young and you get to be an assistant store manager, you kind of, you feel good about yourself. Regional manager? Not assistant regional manager. <laughs> no. uh, I wasn't even, I was, I wasn't even watching the office back then, man. I, I missed, I didn't start watching the office until it was done. Like I didn't start until the whole series was done, which I, I wish I could have gone back and watch it you know, live. But, uh, but yeah, that restaurant just, you know, grocery stores and fast food restaurants, they're going to give you fancy titles in lieu of a pay raise. And that's, there's an office quote where Dwight, like one salesman <laughs> of the month, He's like, I've won salesman a month for 13 of the last 12 <laughs> months. He's like, yep. In March, corporate gave me two plaques in lieu of a pay raise. And that they're like, it's a joke in the show, but they'll do that. They're like, okay, this guy's a pretty good employee. You know, he's, he's going to leave if we don't do something. So let's give him a nickel raise and say he's assistant frozen food manager. And yeah. that'll, that'll get him. And that works. You basically works. combined Joey's experience and mine into one sentence. <laughs> yeah, yeah dude, that was but, tough. <laughs> I see it all well the time. Done, man. Well done. <laughs> like people just, they get so caught up in their titles. Like I th companies realize that, you know, if you, especially older people, I think if you're like older, you know, nothing, I don't want to sound derogatory, but generally older people that work in like fast food positions that are in manager positions, they're still not making a ton of money. And it's tough to like support a family on that. Like, you know, a manager at McDonald's or something might make, you know, 30, 40, 30 to $40,000 a year or something, which isn't a ton of money. Uh, especially if you have a family, but they get caught up in that idea. I've seen it when I worked at fast food restaurants. Like if you're the store manager or the assistant store manager, like that's a title to be proud of. But I was assistant store manager and I was making $8 and 50 cents an hour in 2009. Oh. Oh and I loved I was, it. I was like, I was hey, a manager I, at a cold stone ice cream store and I was making $8 an hour, but I was given the title manager because the, I knew more about how to do the job than the actual manager was because I had been there longer. So the yeah. manager basically started calling me the manager and just showed up to make sure I was doing everything for them, but I never right. got a raise for it. You know, that's what, that's what managers do, man. They, they, I don't know. We could, we could have a whole, we could have a whole podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back to <Yes>. reselling. <laughs> well, let me, let me, I, Hardy's Hardy's uh, it's like a Carl's junior Hardy's and Carl's junior, the same thing, but I think Hardy's is like East coast and Carl's junior is West coast. Uh, but I worked there for two weeks in high school. Uh, and it was the worst experience of my life. I wanted to quit the first day I started, but my mom made me put in a two weeks notice. So I had to work there for two weeks and it was terrible. Uh, everybody was like, they, they acted like I was just some preppy teenage boy who didn't know how to work. And they were right. Like they asked me to do the, <laughs> the, the very first night I started literally, I had never, this is my first job. I'd never worked a job before. And they asked me to do the dishes and I go back and there's the industrial three compartment sink. And there's like, just piles and piles and piles of dishes i'm like what where's the dishwasher like, i don't understand what you want me to do and like, Just call wash the dishes. Ask her how you don't know how to wash dishes i'm like no i'm 15 i i don't know what is this <laughs> like they just treated me like i was stupid for the whole two weeks um and everybody's really unprofessional like like cussing carrying on the guy training me to make sandwiches just literally was a cuss word in between each ingredient of a sandwich. He's like, you just take the MF and lettuce and put it on that GD cheese. I'm like, okay, oh let's my just, gosh. let's, let's get out of here, man. It's <laughs> it. And unfortunately most fast food restaurants are like that. Uh, in my experience, except Chick-fil-A, I've worked at three Chick-fil-A's in my life and they've been wonderful to work for. They just don't pay that much. I heard that Starbucks managers make like 80,000 a year or something like that, but I, I wouldn't know. It's just something I heard, but a anyway. big benefit to Starbucks is that they give uh, health insurance to all of their employees, including like part timers. That's awesome. Like the, Starbucks, the company spends more on health insurance for employees than they do coffee beans. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Fun fact. So I wanted <laughs> something in today's podcast. I wanted to um, tell you guys a little something, and I thought this was kind of weird, but cool at the same time. Um, so basically, I sold this Nickelodeon vintage like time blaster, like alarm clock from like 1995. Mm -hmm. And um, I bought it at Goodwill for, I think it was like three bucks. And I sold it for like 65 bucks on uh, on eBay. 
and I, I go to ship it out and it's, it was, which is awesome. It's only an hour away from me. So I thought that was cool. Um, so I got, I got shipped out and, um, a couple of days later it came back and, um, I was like, why is this coming back to me? You know? And I said, return to sender. Um, I guess the person doesn't live there no more. So I contacted the, you know, the buyer and I was like, Hey man, um, you know, I got your patch- package, <laughs> I got your package back. Um, I guess you don't have the right address on here. You know, what could we do? And he was like, oh man, I'm so sorry. You know, send it to this address. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a second. <laughs> like I, I'm not going to pay for shipping, you know? So how are we going to do this? And then he didn't message me back for like two to three weeks. And I'm like, what I, I i messaged you're him too nice automatically i know you're too nice i, I would never like i would have relisted that thing right then dude. really there's no way he's gonna yeah wow okay mm-hmm. um so i was <laughs> that's crazy i really that blew my mind um but anyways like i waited like i literally waited i was like hey man like i still have your alarm clock he's like oh i just i <laughs> i i just saw this message i'm like really like you spent like 70 bucks on this thing you know, are you like, do you want this? And he's like, yeah, man, just send it to this address. I'm like, no, like we already talked about this three weeks ago. Um, so I was like, look, this is the deal. I'm going to put this thing up for nine hundred and ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents. And you're going to offer me ninety nine cents. He's like, OK, and I was like, all right, so you're going to pay for shipping on this. And he's like, all right, no problems. So <laughs> he buys it. Right. Yeah. OK, hold on. Finish your story. And then I got to say something about that. It's, it's almost done. So he buys it. Right. I go back on the address and I told him, I was like, Hey, make sure you switch your address because you know, it's just not, <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to send it, you know? So he, he, he buys it and it's the same address. I'm like, yo, Ricky, like that's the guy's name. Yo, Ricky. <laughs> You're on a first name basis. Yo, with this guy. <laughs> I'm like, Ricky, bro. I, I know you now. You're like my long lost brother. Like, can you just please switch the address? Or I was like, you know what? Just send it to me. I, I could switch it on here. So he sends it to me. We switch it out. But the funniest thing is I are, I printed it out with that address and I already had the address. So like I'm freaking out. I have to go to work. Like I had five other things I had to ship out. I didn't even get to take them. I'm sweating. I'm trying to get to work. Like it was just nuts. And um, I came back home and I was like, I have to get this label right. I voided the label and I bought it again. Hopefully, I, you know, I'll get the money back from eBay. But, you know, I'm like, wow, dude, like, <laughs> this was the craziest thing ever. But that that sale was very alarming. <laughs> <laughs> and it says it says delivered. So I'm happy. Well, great story there, Joey. But I hate to tell you to be the the what's the ruler of bad news or whatever the air whatever of bad news bear of bad news <laughs> i'm having a brain fart sorry um <laughs> when you list something for 9.99 and then you or 999 dollars and then you tell someone to buy it for 99 cents it's going to show that the sale was 999 dollars but a best offer was accepted so when someone goes to look up comps on that now, they're going to look at the most recent sold <laughs> and show $999. And they're going to get so happy. They're going to get awesome. so happy thinking they just found a rare $1,000 clock. And then they're going to look at completed and they're going to see that it only sold for $0.99. Cents, or they're not going to look at completed and they're going to think that they just found the mother load. I guarantee you. Sit on it forever. I guarantee you by the end of the year, I'm calling it, there will be at least one other clock listed for $999 in Q4. What? I need to make a video about this. <laughs> I need to make a video about this. I'm calling it. <laughs> so, but anyway, that was just what I wanted to say about that. So, uh, yeah, but as far as um, eBay goes, I think, like I said at the beginning, we can all agree that eBay is, you know, our, the, is great. Uh, you know, we all make our money off of eBay and I make money off of other platforms as well. But, um, it's just crazy to me how there are certain things that like you would think they would just listen to the people, you know, and they would make so much more money. You know, I just want to go in there one day and be like, let me help you, you (laughs) know? Um, but it's not my place. So I'm just going to continue to sell on eBay as I do every day and keep moving forward. That's all you can do. Yeah. And I've said in my videos in the past that um, like eBay should care more about their sellers because, you know, if it wasn't for us, they wouldn't make any money. 
But if you're thinking about it from eBay's perspective, really the money comes from the buyers. So I totally understand why eBay like likes to side with the buyers and it's pretty much impossible to be scammed on eBay as a buyer. Like, yeah, like I have people that ask me like, oh, I found this deal, deal on eBay. Is it safe? I'm like, yeah, whatever it is. Like if it's not what it is, eBay is going to make them refund you or refund you themselves. Um, so I, I understand eBay's preference towards the buyer because the buyer, yeah, we're selling stuff, but the buyer's money is where eBay, all of the money comes from, you know, right. Uh, right. And, yeah, and out, outside of like store subscriptions and, you know, things like that, that we pay for. Right. And from that perspective, it is true. And I will agree with that because I heard somebody on Instagram say something like, I can't stand eBay. If it wasn't for sellers, eBay wouldn't have buyers, you know? And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, why don't you flip the script and just think about if eBay didn't have buyers, you couldn't be a seller, Yeah, you know, because that's really what you have to look at is you may be providing products, but if there weren't people that had money, to shop and actually buy, you couldn't sell these things on eBay or, you know, any other reselling platform. It's the same concept. So, you know, there does have to be an equal medium or an under mutual understanding that buyers need sellers and sellers need buyers. So, you know, but when the buyer is the one that's putting out the money, there should be somewhat of an expectation that buyers should have more protection than sellers, which is frustrating for sellers. But you know, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, you know, um, uh, Daily Refinement was talking about it with tech and sports, you know, that you had mentioned earlier, Josh, in one of his podcasts, that returns are so minimal and small in comparison to the big picture of how much people, full time people are actually selling. You know, mm -hmm. your most full time resellers that are, that know what they're doing should have a less than 3% return rate. And most of them are actually between one and 2%. Um, but you should have a less than 3% return rate. And if you're really stressing or, you know, freaking out about a, a return that you get here or there, uh, even if it's a big sale, you know, at the end of the day, it's not worth taking up, you know, headspace in your, yeah. in your mind, especially if I, there's so many people that I've gotten messages and comments from people that are stressed out. They've been worrying about this return for two or three days now, and they don't know what to do. And it's like a $20 sale. I'm like, you, you just refund them, move on. Like yeah. even, you know, I, I had, an, I sold some, uh, like protein bars last week and it was supposed to be a nine pack and it was like a new damaged box, but apparently she was missing two of them. And I didn't respond to her first message because I was I was busy. And she sent me a message like the next day, kind of pissed off about it. And I just gave her a full refund. I'm like, there you go. Whatever. Full refund. Because it's not it's it was like a twenty dollar sale, you know, like so. And she was super happy about it. She's like, oh, thank you. You didn't have to refund me the whole amount. She gave me positive feedback and she asked me if I had another box, you know, so it's it's just not not worth it. I see so many newer resellers, generally it's newer resellers that just have issues and i'm like guys you you're focusing way too much time and attention on this very very small issue like just sell more stuff don't worry about the the like my return rate is probably two three percent maybe depending on the category i guess um yeah so i would say i just i don't fight it on, on moving on you know it don't get hung up like even joey you had mentioned about the combo unit we had talked about it privately and as as much as it sucks you know it's you really just take it as a lesson learned. You can even write it off on your taxes as a loss on your business. So in reality, you're not really losing fully, but you know, and then also for those of you out there that are listening and you may get frustrated with returns, you know, consider how much you paid for the item versus, you know, the actual amount of effort it's going to take to try to get that sale fixed or overturned or, you know, insurance claimed or anything like that. You know, you pay, nine dollars and 99 cents for a combo unit that sells for a hundred you really only have ten dollars into it if you offer free shipping a little bit more you know and you paid a little bit of ebay fees but what is that ten dollars that you lost that you bought it at goodwill for you know versus the amount of time you could spend listing more stuff sourcing more stuff you know all those different types of business strategies i'm sure chick-fil-a and Publix, you know don't cry when they find out that you know, a couple of eggs got broken in the back, mm -hmm. you know, they're not going, the manager's not going to go over there, you know, and mourn, you know, over the loss of one case of, of eggs, because it's a, it's a process in every business. You're going to have yeah. images, you're going to have returns, you're going to have flaws, issues, you know, 
at least I, I love that you say you said Chick fil A and Publix because in, in my experience those are two businesses that are run very well from the customer perspective, and it's like that because you know if your order's wrong at Chick fil A. They're going to say, oh, I'm so sorry about that. Keep the wrong food. You just keep it. You can throw it away. You can eat it, whatever you want to do. We'll make you a completely fresh meal. And whereas if you go to McDonald's, you know, and you your order's wrong, they're going to maybe suck their teeth and maybe call you a liar. You know, it's just not <laughs> the, the experience is so different. I'm like, if, if these other restaurants just looked at Chick-fil-A or these other grocery stores looked at Publix from the customer perspective, not the employee perspective, and just see that if you just... Don't make like, yeah, there's going to be people that are going to abuse your generosity, you know, say they are missing their sandwich when they really aren't, but just give them a sandwich. Just like the, the amount of the return customers that you're going to get because of your, your generosity is going to give you more profitability overall than the loss that you're taking from the few people that are trying to scam you. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you operate like a, yeah, I keep saying McDonald's, nothing against McDonald's. That's just. You know, it's like the running meme of, you know, McDonald's customer service is just terrible. Uh, I don't eat at McDonald's, so I wouldn't actually know. But, you know, when you when you when you try to just pinch pennies and avoid giving people refunds, I worked at a, a Chinese restaurant that was like that. They were terrible. Like if somebody got their food and ate like three bites and it was like cold and they didn't like it, they wanted a refund. They were like, OK, so you ate three bites and so we can give you 80 percent of your money back. I'm like, oh my gosh, like that, just give them a refund. Yeah. Like, nice accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice Chinese accent there. That's what they sound like. So you to Ken, refund your 80%. Ken. But like they really were, dude. They were like that. And, and every customer, anytime a customer complained, they immediately defaulted to that customer was a liar. I'm like, they're probably not. Like, I delivered that and it was 30 minutes late. I know it was cooked an hour and a half ago, so it probably was cold, you know? Yeah. So it's, I, I dealt with that a lot at my scooter shop when I owned my scooter and motorcycle business for five years where customers would come in and accuse me of stuff, you know, or they do whatever they could to try to get, you know, free service or say like, oh, you didn't, you didn't do this right. Like I've had, I could tell you story after story, so I won't, you know, waste your guys' time with that. But um, it just really taught me a lot when I became a reseller that I went so out of my way at my scooter shop to try to make my customers feel like they were getting the Chick-fil-A experience at my scooter shop that I would do. Like there were times where I'd stay open till nine o'clock at night and my doors closed at six because some Disney employee who needs his scooter to get to work the next day broke down and pushed it to my shop for six miles. And I would stay three hours to try to fix their scooter for them. You know, mm -hmm. but those moments is what kind of made my business where people would go tell their friends and say, you know, Hey, wild hog scooters was the best customer service I've ever received. Like you need to go check them out or whatever. And mm -hmm. it may not be the same with online reselling, but like Josh said, when you can do something like tell someone, Hey, just keep it. Um, here's your money back. My apologies. Sorry for the inconvenience. And then they may come back and buy something else. That person probably would not have done that if you would have said, well, send me my item back. I want to inspect it. Like, yeah, it's just not worth your time at that point. Even if they don't buy anything else, you just saved yourself hours of headache, like trying to making sure they send it back and then checking it when they get back and then dealing with more emails, like just end it. it I, I take a small loss on that refund. They're happy. They got their money back. They got their free item, whatever. If they were scamming me, whatever. It's just out of my out of my head it's out of my life i don't have to deal with it anymore and i can focus my time and energy on something else that can be more profitable than that flip 100 percent. how do you feel about that joey like now that we're kind of talking about that and you're obviously experiencing that right now especially since it was your girl's sale which obviously you're trying to protect her um <laughs> you know it it is a rough situation i i feel so bad for her because like it was already past like the time. Like if it was a couple days, I'd be like, Des, don't worry about it. Like just, just give them the money back. Let's just get it back. I really, I really don't, you know, it doesn't bother me. You only bought it for like seven bucks. Like you said, 10 bucks, whatever it was. Um, but I would just be like, you know, with the 30 days over 30 days, um, you know, she already probably spent that money or she put it in a savings account or whatever she did, you know, but you know, she was very bummed out about it, you know, but you know, if it was me personally, I kind of would do the same thing you guys did, you know, just refund them the money and just don't worry about it because think about how much mm -hmm. you just bought it for, you know? Um, yeah. and, and, and I then think that's the hardest mental switch for people in reselling is 
they know that they can maximize an item in profit by selling it for X amount, but then they don't realize it when a return comes back, they think that they're losing a hundred dollars and they're really not losing a hundred. They're losing 10 for what they spent on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for people to realize sometimes because they see the sale versus the actual cost. But then, but, but then also you, you don't want to get that negative feedback, you know, (laughs) because then if you get a negative feedback, then you got to go to eBay, call them. Like you said, that big headache that you have to have over your shoulders. Like it's just not worth it. You know, I do not want a negative feedback, you know? So, so yeah. That's actually a good point too. And as far as negative feedback is concerned, because sometimes I feel like eBay is essentially using scare tactics against sellers with negative feedback going, well, you don't want negative feedback on your account. So always make sure you, you know, just accept the return or refund it. When in reality, sometimes there are situations and I hope I'm not coming across as contradicting myself, but I'm just looking at both perspectives. You know, sometimes there are situations where the buyer is absolutely wrong or even scamming you you know, sending back a different unit than what you purchased or what you sent or something like that. And eBay just says like, oh, you have to take the return, you know, or you'll get negative feedback and it'll affect your seller defect rating. And I don't really like that process, but I do think that, you know, not having negative feedback on your eBay account is obviously like a top priority for all sellers, you know, whereas on Poshmark or Mercari, you could get a one-star review and it literally means nothing because it's just the buyer's opinion of the item, you know, but on eBay, if you get negative feedback because you said the item was blue and they think it's green, you know, (laughs) you still have to spend your time and effort to fight that and waste energy when that is going to affect your eBay account because you can only afford to have a couple negative feedbacks before it becomes like, you know, transaction defect rates on your, on your account. And then eBay doesn't promote your stuff as much. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's just the whole, the whole moral of everything we're talking about is just before you put time and energy into something, just make sure that it's worth it. I've it's, there's so many people out there that are willing to spend six, seven, eight hours on the phone with eBay and going back and forth with customers to avoid a $30 return. You know, I I used to do that when I first started reselling. And if you guys know me and my personality, or you can ask my wife, Like I do not like losing and I'm talking about sports, competition, video Mm -hmm. games and selling on. I'm thinking about the printer, the printer that you sold that was like broken and you spent all day long, but that was a big sale though. Yeah. So, you know, I, I spent all that time trying to fix the printer because it was working. And then when I went to ship it, I just tested it and then the printer head wasn't working right. So I did all these steps and I was sharing it on Instagram. I went back and forth because I didn't want to lose the sale. I could have been listing all day. I could have been sourcing. I could have been having fun. And I was just frustrated. Well, I wasn't frustrated. Actually, I was pretty optimistic because I was hoping that it was going to work. But I was frustrated Mm -hmm. in the end because it didn't. And I had to cancel the sale, you know, which I was happy that I canceled it before I shipped it. But it's still the amount of time and effort I put into trying to fix something rather than just moving on and saying, you know, this was a mistake. I apologize. It's not working. I'm going to refund your money you know, um, sorry for the inconvenience. I tried to really fix that. Uh, and it's really good that you tested it before you shipped it too. Cause I, I personally don't do that. And I didn't even think about doing that until I saw that Instagram story you shared. I'm like, well, I tested this when I listed it. So it's been sitting on the shelf for six months. It's obviously still working, but it's not always the case. And you just shaved, saved yourself and probably 25, 30 bucks in shipping. That was a big printer, you know? Oh, well, more, uh, than, more than that too, because when a buyer sends something back, they don't get the eBay discount that sellers do with shipping. And, you know, and they don't they don't care what it costs. Yeah, 98%, 99.8% of buyers on eBay will just take it to the post office or take it to UPS and say, ship this for me, um, mm-hmm. for this address, and then you get it back and it's like insanely expensive. And then you have to eat that shipping cost. So yeah, with bigger stuff like that, I always double test it. Um, So little pro tip here for you. (laughs) Yep. All right, guys, we are over an hour uh, of this podcast. And I feel like it's been a a very good conversation. We talked about a little bit of everything. And uh, I don't want to I don't want to go too much longer uh, because we need to save some content for next week. Uh, But I definitely appreciate you guys joining me. We're recording this on Sunday afternoon, November 1st. Uh, we've got two months left in 2020. We are almost to the end. Hopefully, uh, 
you know, after the election, everything starts to clear up and then maybe COVID will be gone of the next couple months. <laughs> I wish. Or at least lowered or maybe Joey doesn't have to deliver so much mail. Mary, maybe Drew doesn't have to refund anybody. Maybe I don't have to refund anybody. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're all very optimistic about Q4 going into Q4 and trying to make the most of our, our businesses. Uh, well, we definitely appreciate you guys listening to the podcast. Joey, you haven't said anything in a while. I'll, I'll let you in, in this one. <laughs> So this has been the Triple Podcast, and I'm your <laughs> local mailman. No, but um, I appreciate you guys, uh, the two of you. Uh, it's been a lot of fun this hour. And now that you've blown out the floor's eardrums. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm going to have to lower that down and, and post. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I love you guys. Um, I can't wait for you guys to listen on in. And if you have, um, we just got on Apple Podcasts. I'm so excited. Um, I can't wait to share that. I shared it on my Instagram story. Um, but mm -hmm. I have an iPhone and so does Drew. I don't, Josh, you don't, you don't have an iPhone. I think he has like, I've got a, a I've flip got a, phone uh, or something. And, or? <laughs> I've got an Android. He got, he got it I, I, saw this, I saw this TikTok <laughs> yesterday and it was like, Oh, I'm on the way to buy a new iPhone. And it was just like talking about, Oh yeah, we went back to the iPhone five design and there's a huge bevel and the memory is not expandable. <laughs> uh, and, uh, if it breaks, it's going to be like a minimum $500 and you can't actually fix it yourself. You have to bring it to us. Uh, and it's also only a thousand dollars. It's like oh great. Gosh. I'll take two. <laughs> um, and now there's but... like wireless chargers, but you can't use your old chargers anymore. You yeah, buy the wireless. There's, there's no, there's no power brick. It also doesn't work with USB C. There's no headphone jack, so you have to buy AirPods. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, it's the best gotta of both it. worlds. You gotta love Apple. <laughs> Uh, you don't have to. <laughs> I want to say, if you guys are not subscribed to our YouTube channels, you can find them um, on YouTube. Mine is Profit Monsters. Joey is Joey Bada Bing 22. And you can find Josh's YouTube channel at Harry Tornado, H A I R Y, not H A R R Y. <laughs> and uh, people confuse that from time to time. But, you know, we're all putting out content on a weekly basis between thrifting, sourcing, shipping, listing. Joey has a listing live every Monday night um, where he doesn't list, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Josh goes live a couple times a week where, you know, he's talking about different things that are going on in his business. So you can check all of our YouTube channels out as well. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us on Instagram or leave a comment in this podcast or on any of our YouTube channels, and we will do our best to respond to those for sure and um right. i think that's going to be it for us guys so appreciate you all listening and um have a great day see you guys later <laughs>